shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. May be seated. Can we have all of our veterans please stand? We'd like to honor you. If you've served in any of the branches of our armed forces, would you please stand? Thank you very much for your service. And here's a tribute to our veterans from our children. What motivated you to join the military? I was drafted into the Army when I was 21 years old. My num lottery number was a low number, and the military called on me to, to um, come and fight for my country. Was there any special events that happened um, during your time? Just um, rocket attacks and things like that. that you know, I never thought I would experience anything like that. You know, it was a whole new experience for me. Just, I ne never expected anything like that. Yes, I joined the Navy in order to fly airplanes. I decided I wanted to be a pilot, even though I'd never been in an airplane before I started flight training in the Navy. And that was uh, in 1960. What was one of the toughest parts being in the military? Undoubtedly, the toughest part was being separated from my family. I was on, in the Navy, we used to deploy for six to nine months. One time I was gone for a full year away from my family, and that was the hardest part. What is the most craziest experience that you had? I, I'm, I'm going to say that the first night at Paris Island, uh, we got there on the bus from Charlotte about 12 o'clock at night. That whole night, they kept us awake most of the night, throwing garbage cans and stuff, and then we got a haircut during the night. Uh, and then the next morning, going to, to eat breakfast, it, it was at five o'clock and it was still dark. So all, I didn't, uh, you couldn't see people, all you could see was flashlights. And it was an awesome sight to see uh, 88 guys lined up together. You couldn't see anything but their flashlights swinging back and forth as they marched. It, it, it was, <laughs> I wonder what I had gotten into at that time, but it worked out. Was your faith a big part of the military experience? Definitely. Once when I was in Vietnam, and uh, there was a gunfire support mission that we were called to conduct, and uh, uh, that was tough. Our, our faith that the good Lord was going to take care of us, and He did. What was the toughest part about serving? Leaving my, my family. I had never been anywhere. To tell you the truth, I was a country boy and I just never had been anywhere much. And, and uh, was, that was the hardest part, leaving home. What was it like coming home? It was very interesting because when I came back from Koreatech, for instance, I had to wear my uniform. And I flew into Seattle, and the first thing I knew, people were spitting at me. And they were yelling at me because they didn't like the, the Vietnam War. Yet, you know, but I had to go through them to get home, to, to fly to Michigan. When I did get home, I mean home, home, my family appreciated what I was doing, 
and we really enjoyed a time together. Had to settle in and uh, to find work, you know, after I got out of the, out of the uh, Army. And again, the Lord provided for me to get into work. And I, that was uh, something that I had to get done right away. And it provided a job for me, just how the Lord took care of me. Basic training was the worst part. And after that, uh, I spent two years in Japan. Well, the first thing that it taught me was to be, say yes, sir, and no, sir. Be, you learn that right on, and to remember things like uh, your Air Force serial number, AF1451956, that I still remember 60 years later. How did your faith affect your time in the military? Praying for my father. Just before I went in the military, uh, my father went through three surgeries and a, he lost his left leg above the knee. That was hard. And last night I was looking through some of my old paperwork and I found about a dozen or more bulletins from where I had attended churches in the areas I was stationed. So church and my faith was important. Today we celebrate veterans. Thank you for giving up so much for our freedom. And reminding us of Jesus' sacrifice. All youth grades. This morning is our dedication. We see games on Sunday, November 22nd at 5.30 p.m. We will have some fun, talk about thankfulness, and you get to choose the food. Make sure to bring a friend. Parents, we are bringing back our parent group for every other Sunday. This time is called Christ-Centered Parenting. We will meet and discuss what parenting looks like when it's intentional and share what works best in our homes. Join us our first Sunday back next week, November 22nd at 5 p.m. All parents, if your children are interested in being in this year's Christmas play, please let Pastor Cameron know soon. Practice for the play will begin November 29th, and the practices will be held during the Elevate time on Sunday mornings. The Christmas play will be held on December 20th. At Troy First Baptist, we take a country every week and pray for it. Today, we ask that you take a moment and pray for the people of Guatemala. Mayan culture is enjoying a renaissance after the rediscovery of their ancient civilization. For some, this is a resurrection of the old, long-submerged Mayan religion. But to others, it's a blossoming of indigenous Christianity, aided by the many new translations of the Bible in indigenous languages. Let's pray for the nation of Guatemala, as well as for ours. Lord, we thank you for the gospel that saves any who believe in Jesus Christ. We pray for the 14 million people of Guatemala, many of whom know the gospel, many of whom believe in you. Lord, we pray for those Christians there, that you'll help them to be a witness. Lord, we pray for our country, and I pray that you would give Christians uh, the resolve to pray for the nation and to separate ourselves and make ourselves holy, reach out with the light of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the opportunity we have to worship together this morning. We pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who uh, are staying away because of the virus. Lord, we pray for uh, us. Keep us safe. And Lord, I pray that you will heal those who are sick. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may remain seated. Let's sing together, Our God. turn into wine open the eyes of the blind there's no one like you there's no one like you into the darkness you shine out of the ashes will rise there's no one like you there's no one like in power, our God, our God. Into the darkness you shine, out 
of the ashes will rise There's no one like you There's no one like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power Our God Our God And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then who can stand against it? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then who can stand against? Who can stand? God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us, and if our God is with us, then what can stand against, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us, and if our God is with us, then what can stand against? What can stand against? Let's sing together the great hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou fullest. Thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, Thy hand hath provided. Great is Thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. that endureth thy own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings all mine with ten thousand besides Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hands have provided.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much, Lord. Thank you so much for this place, this time that we can come together, worship in your house, Lord. Please be with us this morning. Be with the pastor as he brings us that message, Lord. Open our hearts, open our minds. Let us hear the message that you have for us, Lord. In your son's name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Ask any child their plans, what they want to be when they grow up, and they can almost certainly tell you, doctor, teacher, astronaut, superhero, cowboy, firefighter, president. What did you want to be when you were a child? Did you fulfill that dream? Are you still asked as an adult what you want to be when you grow up? That's probably not a good sign. What are your plans for the rest of your life? Big plans? Specific plans? Any plans at all? If you would have asked David Budia as a child what he wanted to do when he grew up, he would have told you instantly, an Olympic athlete. When he was seven years old, he watched the 1996 Summer Olympics in Atlanta. It was then that he decided what he wanted to be when he grew up. His parents, both in the Air Force, tried to prepare him for a little dose of reality. Only 10,000 athletes ever make the games and would make the games when he planned for 2012, the London Games. Now that sounds like a lot, 10,000, but when you add up the population of the Earth, your chances are literally one in a million. But David would not be discouraged. He only began telling everyone his plans. And he began making plans to be at the games in Beijing in 2008, even before London and 2012. But is that a good thing to have big plans? The, Robert, uh, the poet Robert Burns said, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. From that quote, John Steinbeck got the title for his classic book of mice and men. The book of James in the Bible would agree. The best laid plans of mortals often do fail or backfire. For instance, see James chapter 4, four verse 13, our text for today. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. James says, wait a minute, hold the phone. You don't know, you can't know about what will happen tomorrow. What is your life, he says, it is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Verse 15, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. He seems to say, never mind planning. You have no control over the future. You might as well just trust God. Let God lead. Should a little seven-year-old David have stopped being so presumptuous, so arrogant, so controlling? Should we not have financial plans, insurance plans, educational or vocational plans? How about vacation plans or retirement plans? Plans for the weekend? Should we give up on history because the world's going to pot, literally in Oregon and Colorado? Or should we give up because our candidate didn't win or because Jesus will surely soon return? Or do we just go ahead and make all those plans but simply punctuate them with the little magic words, if the Lord wills, does that cover it? First, I believe it is rather obvious that God wants us to plan ahead. He does not want us to surrender to a life of randomness or mediocrity. Proverbs 21.5 says, the plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty, but those of everyone who is hasty and doesn't make plans, surely to poverty. Failing to plan is planning to fail. Planning doesn't guarantee success, of course, but it sure increases our chances of achieving it, doesn't it? And a lack of planning doesn't guarantee failure or poverty, but it greatly increases their likelihood. If you're gonna take a long trip, say to Florida, do you just get in your car and drive it any way looks good to you? What if you have no street address, no GPS, no directions to get there? That is no way to travel if you actually want to get somewhere. But isn't that the way many people you know live their lives? 
They have no goal in life. They want, they have no place they really want to get to and no plans to get there. They just kind of wander through life without direction or purpose. Friends, that is no way to live. And I think it's clear that God wants us to have a goal if we're living, one that we want to achieve and plans to get there. Planning ahead includes at least four steps. First, choosing good goals. What do you want to do? On a trip, this would be where do you want to go? In life, what do you want to do to accomplish, to become? In Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, the Apostle Paul expressed a good goal. He said, one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Earlier he had said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So there he's saying, I can't lose either way. But for many, to live is something else other than Christ. So I want you to do an exercise this morning. Fill in the blank. For me to live is, what is it for you? Is it money? Is it sex? Is it fun? Is it fame? Is it power? Is it control? Praise? So whatever you fill in there, for me to live is, what is the second half? For me to die is, think for a moment. If the first part is money, if for me to live is money, then to die is to leave it all. If for me to live is sex or fun, then to die is to end it all. If the beginning is fame or power, then to die is to lose it all. You see, it matters what goal you choose. So what if I choose the Olympics and don't make it? Or what if I do make it? What do I do then? Of course, any goal is better than no goal. Because if you aim for nothing, you will hit it every time. But just don't aim for anything, aim for something, something big, something eternal. You see, a goal is a statement of faith about the future. We don't know, we can't know, but we can change our future if we plan and prepare for it. Good goals are not only about big eternal things, but they are specific, not vague. Don't say, I want to be a better husband, say, I want to take the trash out once a day. Not vague like be more like Jesus, but specific, like I'm going to read my Bible every day for 10 or 15 minutes. How else are you going to know if you've gotten there? These are called SMART goals. Good goals are specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. S-M-A-R-T. Specific. They are measurable, pass or fail. You can't pass or fail better husband, but you can pass or fail taking the garbage out once a day. They're attainable and realistic. You have them high enough to be improbable, but low enough to be possible. Good goals are timely. There are short range and long range, but there is a range, there is a deadline. These are what we call SMART goals, and I would suggest that you start setting up some SMART goals in your life today. But the second step of planning ahead is to set good priorities, which answers the question, which? Which goals are the most important? Which will come first? which are the most likely to be accomplished. It's first things first, right? In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, famously says, seek first the kingdom of God. Make me a priority, he says. First doesn't mean only, doesn't say seek only the kingdom of God. We have to work, we have to rest, we have to eat, we have to love, we have to pay bills. But Jesus said some things are clearly more important than others. So you've got to put them first. You've only got a limited amount of time. As Paul tells us in Ephesians 5, walk circumspectly, carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming, making the most of the time because the days are evil, the days are short, they're limited. Don't spend most of your life doing things that are unimportant. What are you doing today that will matter 10,000 years from now? What are you doing now that will matter 10 years from now? Just like if you aim for nothing, you'll hit it every time. If you aim for everything, you'll probably hit nothing. I'm not saying you should have only one goal. You should have more than one, many. I'm just saying that you should prioritize them so that you work more on the most important ones. And if you just let urgency decide, you'll seldom work on the most important priority goals because the urgent is seldom important and the important is seldom urgent. We could spend our lives putting out brush fires and never accomplishing our most important goals. 
So we should each prioritize our goals according to our value system. What is most important? High priority would be things that I must do. Medium priority is things that I should do if I can. Low priorities are things that I can do if I have the time, but without priorities, we won't accomplish the most important things. Then, more importantly, the third step of planning is making good plans. It's the actual planning. So that answers the how. How am I going to get there? Some people spend half their lives wishing for things they could have if they didn't spend half their lives wishing. You've got to do something about what you wish for. But if you do something without planning, first you'll probably just be spinning your wheels. In Luke 14, Jesus says, Which of you intending to build a tower or even a shed does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation, he's not able to finish it? Jesus said if you're going to build a building, like we have prioritized some things that we'd like to do in the building plans that are at the front of the church today, First, sit down. If you want to do a welcome center, a restroom in the, in the foyer, if you want to do the kitchen, if you want to do certain things, then you need some blueprints. Because if you just start building without blueprints, you're going to have chaos on your hands. What would the building look like without blueprints? It wouldn't be called a building, right? What is life called without plants? Usually chaos. Many use the excuse, I don't have time to plan. Wrong. None of us have time not to plan. The little bit of time spent at the beginning of a building project saves lots of times later in the building project. Much more time than if you had no plan. As a matter of fact, that project that takes you three hours to do would have taken, if you took a half an hour to plan, might have taken you only an hour, an hour and a half. The truth is, if you don't plan your day or your life, someone else will. The urgent will crowd out the important Something will plan your life. Will it be you? So will you attack the future with a plan or just let life come at you at random? Sounds like a pretty easy choice, right? You choose your life, random or accomplishment. The most important step is the fourth step, and that is actually carrying out the plan. I'll call that live a great life. When are we going to do it? Better start now. Okay, dreamer, when are you going to actually start as I was typing out this page of the PowerPoint, I've got to type out all those words every week for Sunday, I looked off out in the distance. There was a great big rainfall this week. Did you see it? And I didn't know it, but while I was looking out the window, my finger was resting on a key, and when I looked back at the computer, I had typed three rows of Zs. You know what a bunch of Zs stands for, right? Sometimes I have fallen asleep at the keyboard, but not this week. But... I can type a lot of Z's in my life if I take a nap and don't make plans. In 1 Chronicles chapter 28, Paul, David says to his son Solomon, Be strong and do it, verse 10. Again, verse 20, be strong and be of good courage and do it. Maybe this is where Nike got its famous slogan. Do not fear nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, my God, will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Seems like the Lord is with us a lot more when we plan and when we do something. So it's important to plan your work and then to work your plan. Some people's problem is that they don't plan. It's kind of ready, fire, and then aim. But others' problem is that they never pull the trigger. It's ready, aim, and falling off to sleep. But I might miss, you say. Well, as Hall of Fame hockey player Wayne Gretzky said, the one who set every scoring record in the NHL, 100% of the shots you don't take won't go in. You will miss goals. But if you never shoot, you will never make it. Choose good goals, set good priorities, make good plans, and then live a great life. Let me tell David Budia's story. He began training as a gymnast for the Olympics. But he found out he wasn't very good at and he didn't like gymnastics. So he started diving. The only problem was he was terrified of heights. And the board in the competition is 10 meters or 30 feet high. That's all the way up at the top of the ceiling here. Then you jump off and you hit the water at 35 miles an hour. But David went to a sports psychologist, overcame his fear, and he pulled the trigger. He made a plan, and then he worked his plan. 
five hours a day, 300 days a year for 10 years. And against all odds, he made the USA Olympic team that went to Beijing in 2008. He was just 18 years old and he didn't even place. But he came in fifth in the world. If he hadn't planned, he wouldn't have even made it to Beijing. He had great plans and good results. But he soon discovered that he left something or someone out of his plans. You ever forget something? You get out to the car and you realize you don't have your keys. You get in the car, you don't have your wallet. Or now you go into the store and you forgot your mask. You forgot an appointment. Well, David Budia forgot something. And God doesn't want us to forget something. What James is telling us in chapter 4 is that we shouldn't plan. Not that we shouldn't plan at all, but that we shouldn't plan and leave him out. God doesn't want us to presume. Remember our text says in verse 13, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city. Oh, yeah, you think. How do you know? Maybe the roads will be flooded. Good plans presume things. He says, you presume the place, there, here or there. You presume the time, today or tomorrow. How many of us even know we have a year? We don't know that. They presume the outcome. We will buy and sell and make a profit. You don't know that. Now, it's good to have optimism. That's great. There's a difference, though, between faith and presumption. Faith is believing God for what he's promised. Presumption is believing for what he has not promised. That's the name it, claim it theology of the faith healers. James gives us three things not to forget here, to presume in planning ahead. First, do not forget the future is uncertain. Verse 14 says, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. Say that with me. You do not know what will happen tomorrow. Well, pollsters certainly find that out every four years. You think they'll have a job in four years? Weather persons find this out almost every day. Financial experts, sports pregame hosts, doctors, none of us really know what will happen tomorrow. You ever hear of reverse mortgages? They're still kind of new in our country. That's where someone who owns their home sells it to someone but keeps the right to live in it and someone else presumes that they're going to buy it and when that person dies they will then give the inheritors you know a certain amount what's ever left over they're relatively new in our country but they've been for a long time in France and one of the first reverse mortgages in 1965 was bought by Andre Francois Raffet who was 47 at the time and Andre worked out a deal to pay Jean Calment, then 90, $500 a month to buy her home. Whatever was left over when she died, she would pay to her heirs. 30 years later, Andre Francois died at 77, still paying the $500 a month to Jean, who at that time was the world's oldest living person at 120. She outlived him by two years and died at 122. And get this, Andre Francois paid $184,000 for a home he never lived in. You never know, do you? Proverbs 27.1 says something very similar. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. James is often called the New Testament book of Proverbs. You do not know, and to be honest, we can plan all we want, but we do not and cannot know. So it makes sense to plan, but in planning, make room for the unexpected, right? David Boudia came in fifth at the 2008 Beijing Olympics, having learned there were many things that he could not control in competition and in life. He couldn't control what the other divers did. He couldn't control what the judges said. He could only control his preparation, and his attitude. He turned to the, came back to the USA and went to Purdue University to train for the 2012 London Olympics. He also discovered that he couldn't control his own life. He says that he never really knew Jesus as a living person, but through the consistent witness of his college coach Adam, he gave his life to Christ, who turned his life upside down and helped him focus and bring every thought captive. After four more hard years of training, another 10,000 hours of grueling discipline, he made it to London. In the preliminaries, he said he was arrogant. He bombed. 
He came in 18th and barely made the semifinals in the final spot. He was humbled. He said he spent the evening on his knees in prayer, acknowledging his pride and asking God to conform him to God's will. He says that he finally realized he was not in control, that God was. When will we learn what Andre Francois and David Boudia had to learn the hard way? According to James, the second thing to not forget is that life is short. Don't forget when you presume in planning that life is short. James tells it like it is. Your life is nothing more than a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. You don't have forever. You're a puff of smoke, a ripple in the stream of time. You're here today and gone tomorrow. Do you remember when you were young and you had all the time in the world? Every day seemed like an eternity. Do you remember watching the clock in school, waiting for it to finally hit 3 o'clock? And it seemed like the clock had stopped. Now I can watch the clock and it seems like someone has put the second hand on speed dial. It's amazing how quickly time goes now. Then it seemed like the clock was going backwards. It seemed like Christmas would take forever. But when you get older, it goes back just like this, right? I can't believe it's Christmas time again. It seems like just yesterday I was taking the Christmas tree back upstairs. I've had constant reminders. I remember a few years ago, the first time I remember carrying the Christmas tree up from the basement at that time thinking, how many more years do I get to do this? Maybe not that many. I put a light bulb in this week that said it's rated to last 27 years. And I thought, someone else will probably be replacing this light bulb. Where did the time go? We need to remind ourselves. These reminders are good things. David says in Psalm 39, verse 4, Lord, make me to know my end, and what is the measure of my days, that I may know how frail I am. Indeed, you've made my days as handbreadths, and my age as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is but vapor. Sound familiar? Wow. You get past a certain age and you realize that. Going into his final dive in the 2012 London Olympics, David Boudia had no idea where he was in the standings. He just knew he was blessed to still be in the competition at this point. There were a lot of things pressuring him. There were 18,000 people watching him live and hundreds of millions of people watching him around the world. He was going to enter the water at 35 miles an hour and hope that that tiny little bathing suit stayed on. And then the diver, just before him, was awarded a rare redrive, a redive, because the judges said the camera flashes distracted the British diver. <clears throat> they were British judges. Hmm. So he got a second dive. That's kind of like icing an NFL field goal kicker. So David finally got his chance, and he climbed to the top of the tower, hoping just to nail his normal dive. But standing there, he said it hit him. All this time, all this preparation, 10,000 hours of training for this one moment that would last one and a half seconds. Six dives, all told, eight and a half seconds. So he took a deep breath, relaxed, and thought, you know what? God's in control of these one and a half seconds. Someday, if God wills, you will live a long life and you will look back on your life and say, wow, that went by quickly. But no matter how long you live, in eternity, this life seems like a moment. It's a grand moment in time, yes, but it's a moment. You only get one life, so plan it, but don't leave God out. According to James, the third thing to not forget, to not presume in planning, don't forget God is God. Verse 15, indeed, you should say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or do that. If you don't, you're boasting in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Now, that doesn't mean Lord willing is a magic word that we use to tag on to our plans. I've heard it used that way. Have you ever? Well, I'll see you in church on Sunday, Pastor, Lord willing, which means probably I won't see him in church on Sunday, and somehow it'll have been the Lord's will that they didn't make it. Or I hope to finish... I get a par on the back nine, Lord willing. I hope to have a burger for lunch, Lord willing. Seems to me that's just using the Lord's name in vain. Are we really praying about the Lord's will? Or are we just kind of hoping with a little luck we get what we want? It's not a magic phrase. It's an attitude and awareness that God is God. 
And I don't know what tomorrow holds, but God, you do. I don't know how long I have on earth, but God, you do. And I acknowledge that you have the right to change my plans. David again says in the Psalm, Psalm 33, 10, The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Somebody wisely said, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. But God is not cruel like a child torturing a bug. I think he's more like a loving parent who, when hearing their child confidently saying, I can eat the whole thing, knows a little bit better. I can do it myself. They laugh knowing better. How many times have you decided what to do and left God out as if he didn't exist, like a practical atheist? Last week, we saw ourselves disregarding God by setting ourselves up as judges. This week, we see ourselves disregarding God by leaving him out of our plans, which has pretty much the same results. On the diving board before his final dive, David Budia was calm. He was about to try a difficult back two-and-a-half somersault with two-and-a-half twists. But a moment before he climbed the board... As he waited on his knees in prayer for the previous diver to get his redive, he got a text message on his phone from his old coach, Adam, who led him to Jesus. And here is what Adam said. What is there to be anxious about? God already knows the outcome. You're just the vehicle for his glory. Go out there and do what it takes to glorify him. David thought on that challenge, and he dove. And he received the highest score, not only of his life, but of any diver on any dive in the entire competition, a 102.6, to take a surprise gold medal, the first for a U.S. male diver since Greg Louganis in 1988, a year before David was born. True confession, I'm not a big Olympics fan. I didn't see one of David's dives. I didn't see any Olympic event that year or any year since. Before I met him, I had never even heard of David Budia. But I was preparing this message when I went to a financial seminar for planning for your retirement. And I was disappointed to have to sit through an hour of some young kid who was an Olympic athlete who knew nothing about retirement. But he began to speak. And I began to hear not only advice on planning and hard work, which I was going to be preaching on on Sunday, but also on how something changed his life in 2010, which I suspected to be the Lord. And then he listed in this talk his priorities as faith first, then family, then career. So I waited around afterwards to introduce myself. And I asked David if he was a Christian, and he said yes. And he began to give his testimony to the I told him that I would have to change my plans for Sunday sermon and include him in it. I asked if I could take a picture. I asked if I could talk about his one and a half seconds and his text message. You see, David had a driving goal and some fantastic plans that took him to the top of the world in 2008, but he left God out. He forgot the future is uncertain, that life is short, and that God is God. But then, by 2012, he said, if the Lord wills, by all means, have goals, prioritize them, make smart goals and start working out. But do not leave God out. And remember that God has goals for you, too. You might call them the real best laid plans or God's. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this reminder from the book of James of the shortness of life and the importance of priorities and plans. But Lord, teach us to make smart plans that include you. Lord, help us to remember that life is short and that you are God. And Lord, if there's one here or one watching from afar that has never trusted in Christ as Savior, I pray that today 
they'll do what they're glad they'll be glad they've done when they stand before you in eternity they'll repent and they'll accept christ as savior lord for those of us who are your children lord help us to put you first help us to plan but help us to leave the door open for you to change our plans for in christ's name we pray amen we're going to stand together and sing that great hymn of faith we sang earlier great is thy faithfulness would you stand with me please let's sing